Hi, I'm Tony Giddens, director of the Washington DC International Film Festival. We are very proud this year to have the world premiere of a brand new film. It's called In Balanchine's Classroom. And it's about the famous ballet teacher and dancer himself, uh, George Balanchine changed the way ballet was performed. We have with us today, the director of the film, Connie Hotchman, and the producer of the film, Mark Hotchman. They'll be in conversation with Julie Kent. Julie is the artistic director of the Washington Ballet. I'm sure you'll enjoy this very insightful interview and thank you for joining us. I am Julie Kent, artistic director of the Washington Ballet and former ballerina with the American Ballet Theater. And it is my great pleasure to be with you all here this evening. And uh, I wanna thank um, DC Film Festival director, uh, Tony Gittens for this wonderful invitation to host a conversation and talk back with the director, producer, and executive producer of the film In Balanchine's Classroom. We are thrilled to have the world premiere of this film here in the nation's capital. It will have its premiere at the DC Film Fest, which opens June 4th and will play through June 8th. And the official in-theater premiere will be in New York City at the Film Forum on September 17th and will be distributed nationwide and hopefully internationally by Zeitgeist Films. So welcome uh, to Connie and Mark Hockman. Uh, hi, Connie and Mark. Hi. Welcome to Washington, zooming into Washington. Thrilled to have you both. And I can't wait to dive into this beautiful film, which to any dancer is, is a treasure for so many reasons, not just because of the capture of Mr. Balanchine, but all the other voices um, that are each one in themselves a luminary and, and um, a generation that's passing. So can you just, uh, let's start with the inspiration for the film. What was struck me initially as the most powerful element immediately was to hear Mr. Balanchine's voice. Not because I had heard it before, but because I know for anyone who's lost someone to hear the voice of somebody that you had cared so deeply about and loved and admired to hear it back must be a very moving thing for so many dancers. So let's just start with the inspiration and, and the very beginning. Okay. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's our first time actually talking about the film in this way. Um, the inspiration was, uh, multifold. The first, the first um, thing that comes to mind is um, when I was a child uh, and uh, just entered School of American Ballet at age 10, it was 1964 and it was the year that the New York City Ballet moved to the New York State Theater. It was a very big year because Balanchine was restaging his ballets from city center, small stage, to this huge new stage. And all the ballets that called for children that I got to be in, Nutcracker and Midsummers, he was on stage placing us and, and really working hands-on with the, the whole ballet uh, and a, a lot of the time with the children. So I got to um, interact a bit with Balanchine as he, as he directed us, but I also got to observe him with his dancers. And that was a very big, uh, big uh, experience and inspiration because it was palpable. What was between him and from the principles to the core, very relaxed atmosphere, people chit chatting, very um, familiar, but at the same time, there was this respect and this, just this, I mean, I, felt I was picking up on a love, a bond between them. So then fast forward, um, I got into Pennsylvania Ballet and danced and went on, became a teacher. Every time that I was uh, 
in an experience with a balancing trained dancer, whether it was the ballet master at Pennsylvania Ballet, Robert Rodham, who had danced for Balanchine, teaching for Lynn Stetson, Balanchine dancer in Rye, I could tell there was some knowledge that I was not privy to. Even though I went through the School of American Ballet, danced maybe eight or 10 of his ballets, there was something they knew that I didn't know, that I wanted to know. Um, and then when I started doing the interviews to find out what happened in this classroom, what came out of these dancers was a flood. Once the dam broke, they didn't really want to talk about the class at first. I had to kind of pry and, but once the dam opened, there was a flood and I couldn't stop. Everyone who would talk to me, I wanted to hear from. Right. So I think that it, your response somewhat answers the next question that I wanted to ask you, but I think that it's really fascinating of all the history and the impact and the huge story of Balanchine's life to dedicate a film specifically focused on him as a teacher um, was really, it, it was clearly the whole uh, point of the film because not as an, the institution or the icon or the, even as the choreographer, but it was as the teacher and as the mentor. Um, so can you just share a little bit more about how, when you started to uh, collect, how, how was your process as far as, um, once you dive in, you're never going to, you're never quite sure uh, what you're going to get. So how did you start that process of sort of narrowing and, and focusing that story, which then in the end you had your title or did you start with your title first title you know like any like any work of art the name can often direct uh forwards or backwards so i'm just curious about that process a bit well i just want to go back there was one there was one experience i had that was very telling when my friends were getting into new york city ballet and i was getting the feeling that that's that's not where i was going to dance i was going to dance somewhere else. Um, I would ask my friends, um, we had gone through the school together, same, same experience, very, very hard classes. Maybe you had some of the teachers, Julie, at yes. American Ballet, Tim, Tim Kofsky, and yes, I do. very hard classes. And yes. <laughs> so, but when they got into the company, I knew Balanchine was teaching a morning class we just somehow knew he taught a morning class to his company. And I would ask my very close friends, we shared everything, tell me about, tell me about his class. And they would clam up, they would roll their eyes, they would, <laughs> they would brush me off like that. And worse, worse than that, they wouldn't tell me about it. And I, I they really meant it. They wouldn't, they didn't want to talk about it. So that um, when I when I finally started the interviews, that was where I started. Why don't people want to talk about his class? What happened there? <laughs> and it was just as Dan Duell called it a crucible. It wasn't only crucible; it was many other things. But um, once I spoke to them on that level. And I understood there was something off-putting about the class. They could dive in. Well, it just was insane. And it was right. too fast. And he didn't warm you up. And it all, they were happy to defend why they didn't want to talk about it. Right. Then there was a whole nother level. Right. I mean, I think that I, I can't remember what who expressed it so well. But as a dancer, your class is is about the instrument, right? So you're trying to warm everything properly. You're trying to, you know, both stretch and strengthen. You're trying to sharpen your skills. You're trying to prepare yourself for the rest of the day. You're trying to like, like a penis would do scales or, or 
a singer would warm up their voice. But Balanchine clearly had a different idea about what class was going to be when he was leading it. It wasn't about that. It was about experimentation and challenge, challenging. You know, how do you respond to that? And and I loved also the footage. Um, and of course, you know, I'm so privileged to to know all of the the dancers that were on uh, the in the film. Obviously, um, they were they they were my idols as as a young dancer. And then many of them became coaches, mentors, taught me balancing reps. So I was thrilled to see them. But the amount of eye rolling and exasperation and I can't do this and, you know, just the, 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 um, there was no restraint on the expression of the, like, <laughs> frustration, um, which I love to see because we've all, every dancer's been there. Um, and yet they just kept going. Or that incredible scene, I bet, I think it was Victor Castelli, um, with the repetition, just keep, he just kept doing the same step over and over, like, seemed like endlessly. I don't even know if there was music, but it was just fascinating. So I love that it, I love that it all, it's, that seed is, is the young dancer and you who's curious about, you know, what's happening there and, and why are you reticent to share? And what a fabulous and, and fascinating um, way to dive into telling that story. So I think, you know, there's so many um, in, a, in this film, you know, shines, shines light on Balanchine, the teacher, but there's so many um, attributes and sort of uh, in unique and brilliant qualities that Balanchine had as, as a leader, choreographer, artistic director, uh, innovator, um, and all, you know, all of the hats that you have to wear, but what do you think, um, was one of the greatest galvanizers that secured his success with the dancers? Um, he, um, what they say is, well, they felt his love for them and, his care for them as dancers and his desire to develop their potential so deeply. Um, he, he, he could teach to the class, but he, could, he also taught to the individual. And they felt that he saw into them, many, many of them say he he knew you before you knew yourself. He knew what you could do. And I think it, it had an addictive quality working with him, not just the class, the whole day, you know, choreographing with you in the room, performing for him. Um, one of the most beautiful uh, aspects of the experience to me was how they described how he would be in that wing every single night. Edward Vallow says they built a little shelf for him to lean on and he was almost on stage with you. But and Karin, Karin describes how dancing for him, it wasn't like a, um, a judgmental kind of um, harsh. He was adoring them and you felt like you were in a bubble. Maybe the next morning in class, he'd be giving steps that you needed to work on, but he absolutely loved um them as dancers and was inspired by them. And I think that was a symbiotic relationship that just kept growing. Yeah, I, 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 it's clearly revealed in, in the interviews and, and the results. I mean, I think the choreography, you know, that the relationship, the love, trust, the benefits, I mean, the art and, um, because you know, I don't know. I don't know how many teachers would be able to teach a class like that and have students. Right? <laughs> Only balancing. <laughs> um, and I mean, uh, I, I because just for all those reasons that it's uh, it's a it was clearly a devotion for those people that were in that class every day. 
it and was really the best. only a fraction of the company took the class in the <laughs> beginning when someone joined the company as a young dancer they, they a new dancer they would take the class but many of them dropped out right i mean you could i love that um eddie valella was so honest about it. I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't do the class and be a dancer. Like I physically could not put my body through that and then do the performances that I needed to do. So I tried to find a way to do it with, you know, finding Stanley. It was just, a, you know, such an, another really, I mean, that's your next documentary, right? Is <laughs> uh, Stanley Williams. Um, but I love that honesty about it. He would have loved to do in the class, but I couldn't do it. And that's also the reality. Like there is a limit to what, how far you can push the body. And so I'm sure that that was a, a very difficult um, sort of decision to make. Am I going to be in there for class? Or um, and then I think Meryl Ashley's. Um, also just so generous with her candor about you know i was i was not sure and then i became more sure and then i saw the results and then i became a, a disciple i mean that she was very i i also i loved that 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 she was so vul making herself vulnerable with the whole process not just the legacy of Meryl Ashley, who, you know, we all think of as somebody who just always mastered everything, um, but that she shared all of the, the journey of how she became the dancer that um, that Mr. Balanchine saw, thought she could be, you know, it was very beautiful. I love that. You know, by nature, dance is ephemeral, you know, it, it captures a moment in time, but as soon as you stop moving, it's a memory, it's finished. Which is something that makes it so precious and something that I love about it. But I often envy painters who have a canvas to admire and mem remember each brushstroke and how they came. And we, we don't, you know, so we have a physical memory and, and we share that memory with those who are um, fortunate to either share the experience with you on the stage or in the audience. So there, there's something very valuable and special there. But I, I was I was very much intrigued with um, the part of the film when uh, Mr. Balanchine was talking about it's not right. It's not it's not you know they're doing it not right. And so I'm just wondering now in the 21st century. Um, let's see, coming on close to 40 years after his death. Is it, is it really important for all dancers that perform Balanchine's works to understand what he wanted? Or is it valid, more important, as important, to find new definition in the steps and new life, new, a new point of view in the choreography? That's a hard question. Um, you know, Balanchine taught, um, he started teaching wherever he could as soon as he got to America and started School of American Ballet. He was teaching, there are almost no dancers. The, the dancers he did serenade on were not really well trained, but he was in there. And he loved working with any stage of dancer. He just loved working with dancers. Um, ballet russe dancers, you know, he just always saw where it could go. So I think today, I mean, I, I could never speak for Balanchine, but I, I do feel he'd be excited by today's dancers and the potential and the and personalities. And um, he would just dive in right where they are. As far as dancers learning what Balanchine taught, I don't think it... I couldn't say it's necessary. We're in a whole different time and dance has evolved. And, um, this is their time. Dancers, this is their time. And they have to be here. They can't be thinking about the past. But I do think if those dancers who were interested in what Balanchine's dancers have to share, what they know, and um, I think it's a treasure chest 
that the dancers today would find, um, some of them would find absolutely thrilling. Um, I don't think it would be stale. I think it, it, I think it would, it's timeless, what he understood about the body. And uh, as Meryl says, torque, and why those tendus needed to be absolutely, as Jacques says, geometrically precise. Su Su, you know, he understood what the center does and the freedom it gives. Um, so I think it would be just a, a experience of discovery for the dancers today to dive in, but not that they have to. Right. I I mean I I saw also in in Merrill's one of Merrill's segments how it was so important it is so important to her in her um, coaching to try to get it right right and to try um, to try to divine. <laughs> what she felt like he would want or try to articulate what she learned in a way that would manifest the kind of result. And so, I mean, it's, it is a big responsibility to when you're uh, pet paying, when you're the bearer of the legacy, right? When you're the, the next in line sharing, sharing the information. Um, but I mean, Personally, I, I, I agree with you. It's sort of we all, as you know, everything moves forward in life. It's forward moving progression. Um, and it's the, just all the strings and stories and information that you can get from as many sources as possible that then inform, you know, how you interpret anything, whether it's text, dance, music, anything. And um, what a wealth of voices that you were able to capture in this film. I mean, when I looked at the credits, I was, you know, over a hundred uh, dancers. And, you know, I think I would love to hear, and Mark, maybe you can um, jump in. The, ball the ballerinas are <laughs> taking over the conversation here. <laughs> um, I'll refer to as the silent partner. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, yeah, usually, yeah, dancers are, you know, trained. Um, but once we do get a chance to speak, generally we, we have a whole lot to share. So, but I'm just curious about, you know, how you, in the editing process, how you chose to to put the light on voices. Uh, you, you know, you had over a hundred luminaries, um, you know, Patty McBride, who was, you know, a particularly um, beloved to me and so, just so many voices and I'm just wondering um, what what a resource that is and and how did you how did you process that and what about all the other stories that we could divine really quickly from the silent one um, that to choose who wound up being in the final film was probably the most the singular most difficult part of doing it. Connie tried probably four or five, six versions earlier to squeeze as many voices, faces in because everybody was marvelous. Two, because everybody was so marvelous, we realized that apart and separate from the film, we must create and provide a platform for all of the interviews to be heard in their entirety for everyone. Oh, what a what a treasure that would be. Oh my goodness. So we've already begun the, the preliminary stages of creating an archive um, that will be uh, as broadly accessible as, as possible. And now the silent one goes back to silence. <laughs> Connie, I'm sure we'll have a few things to say. So thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're calling it the IBC Digital Archive, and uh, it's going to be cutting edge, and you can navigate, you can jump from topic to topic, and we're, we're very excited about it. That, I mean, this film is a, 
just thank you for making it. It is so, it was so beautiful. Um, and I can't wait to share it with my colleagues and, and discuss, but that archive old footage and, and the platform that you're developing, what an incredible gift that will be to all of us who, um, just to hear all the stories and, you know, to see Jacques D'Amboise captured and, 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 and that we lost him so recently, it was just so, so moving. Um, um, because like Balanchine, man, many of those, uh, his protégés are, you know, they're, they're very much loved in their own right, you know, by many more generations. So, um, thank you for, for that. Um, and tell us a little more about the footage, um, because it was clear that never be seen, never seen before, um, home movies and very intimate. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure some of the dancers would not have been so candid if it had been, you know, CBS or, you know, uh, television recording or professional, that it was just sort of home movies. You really got to feel um, the more human connection between between everyone. So how did you find that? Um, uh, you know, I had to learn, kind of start a whole new art form when I wanted to make this film. And um, I had to seek advice from experienced filmmakers. And one person said, after she heard a sampling of the interviews, these are wonderful, but you can't do talking heads you have to she, she said you have to search the earth for yeah. all the footage you can find of balancing and i said it's it, it's already known we know what's out there people have made documentaries and um she said just keep looking there's more and she was not a dance person so um we practically lived in the uh, New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. I was up till the wee hours of the morning reading the metadata. And if if anything said anything like Balanchine works with dancer, we'd go there and find that tiny clip that wasn't even digitized. And we couldn't fast forward or rewind. We could watch it one time and they hadn't, they hadn't saved this footage yet. By now they have. But we just found um, a lot that way. They kept then, the sleeping bag in the corner for me <laughs> of the amount of time we were there. And then I can imagine what a labor of love, though. I mean, you, you would. This is so fascinating because you know when you watch the finished product, unless you're, unless you know, you just you have no idea that just all of the detail and and exploration and uh, that you had to go to and we couldn't use the, we couldn't use all of it there was one moment of of balancing taking after a, a full run through of i think copelia took one of the soloists and just just took her by the hand and she was just walking on point and rolling through slow oh. motion and he was just helping her roll through her foot quietly slow that we couldn't use. There's so many little moments. Wow. But I wanted to tell you that the other footage that is the home movie footage, I'm only going to tell you part of this because people just have to go see it. But um, band, class was private. People were not allowed to watch class. That he, Rehearsals, he didn't mind. Chore, when he was choreographing, he didn't mind. People would be up front, you know, on the bench or stools. It was very relaxed, but class was private time for him and his dancers. Uh, so there was one dancer in the company who, whether they were on tour or in New York, she had one of these video cameras from the 70s and <laughs> just wanted, she felt like this is important, someone has to film. And he trusted her, he loved his dancers. They were family. He didn't have children, they were his family. And he didn't mind, he trusted, she's filming and he'd wave. And this one dancer just kept filming and filming and filming. And over the years making this film, uh, people kept pointing towards, they wouldn't use her name, but they'd say someone filmed, someone has footage. And finally, someone told me who, and finally she met with me 
And we both cried when she gave us permission to use it. And, and um, she trusted me enough. And uh, that is the jewel to me of the film, this home movie footage. That sometimes I feel like she was standing right next to him in the wing, whether it's dress rehearsal, rehearsal, and he was watching and she was just there. So she gets credited. Good. Yeah, I, I saw the credit. <laughs> but it is, I mean, the, um, the familial aspect of, of the company, which is a part of our, it's just, a, it's our milieu. It's the work itself is so revealing and, um, in order to make yourself vulnerable like that, there has to be a level of trust in the room. And so, um, and with those deep familial connections are always complications, just like in any family. <laughs> so there's there's a lot, but but that it was captured in, in such a beautiful way. And then all the, the interviews supported that. Um, it, it was just, it was very, very moving. Um, I'm just wondering, because I, I know some of the, the more recent rehearsals that you also shared, how long did this film take to make? Um, because I know it must have been taken quite a lot of time. The first interviews, and it was a book idea to start. Uh, after about five interviews, when I saw them, you know, quasi and, and how they spoke, I knew it had to be. A, on film, but it was a book idea to start. But the first interview was probably 2006. It's 15 it's years. Bravo and bravo for sticking with it because that is, you know, I I I knew that it had been at probably at least 10 years, but that, that additional five um that's just so it's so impressive such a labor of love and um i can't wait i really can't wait to watch it again and 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 watch it with some of my colleagues i want to give a shout out to the dancer who the balancing dancer who did the first interview who trusted me enough to sit in front of a camera um and that's victoria simon oh she, she, we did it at steps and there was noise coming through, but we just sat there and she was willing to be my my first. So oh, how generous. Vicky taught me symphony and C and she made me feel like I was so beautiful in the second movement. I'll never I'll never forget that. And what I mean, what an incredible um what an incredible ballet, but it very, very difficult for everyone. So um I'll never forget that. I had a wonderful experience with her as well. So well, thank you, Vicki, for starting this in incredible journey. Um, and thanks to you, Mark and Connie, for just, you know, this, it's a treasure. And all that will follow with your um, IBC um, archival footage platform will be a another treasure. So I just very, very, as a, as a dancer and as a lover of ballet and also as somebody who is stewarding the art form forward, I, I'm just so appreciative of everything that you've put into this film. And I can't, I'm also very proud that it's premiering uh, in, it's getting its world premiere in Washington, DC. So. Capital idea. Thanks. Capital idea, yes. <laughs> And also on June 4th, which is the Washington Ballet's Gala. So it'll be a great night for ballet in Washington, D.C., June 4th. And all the best with the gala yes. and mayor. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you all for joining us and for this wonderful conversation. And please do go to the D.C. Film Fest June 4th through 8th and watch In Balanchine's Classroom. Thank you, Julie. Thanks. Wonderful.